Good morning, everybody. My name is Kristen, and I have the privilege of introducing to you today our speaker and the author of the Cerulean Bowl. Paula Teague is the Senior Director of Spiritual Care and Chaplaincy for Johns Hopkins Health System. She's a certified educator with the Association for Clinical Pastoral Education and a certified positive psychology coach. She has a Doctor of Ministry from Columbia in Atlanta and an MBA from Johns Hopkins. Paula, we're so grateful to have you here. Thank you, glad to be with you. Yep. Yes, our presentation today will look more like a conversation. So I'm gonna ask Paula a series of questions before opening up the Q&A to the rest of you. Um, as always, feel free to type your questions in the chat or raise your hand using that particular feature on Zoom. I may ask you to unmute yourself to share. So without further ado, let's begin. Right. Paula, can you tell us about yourself and your current role? Yeah, thank you. Um, um, so again, thank you for the opportunity to be here with you all. This is lovely. Um, I, as, as Kristen said, I'm the Senior Director of Spiritual Care at Johns Hopkins, and I have many hats. And the reason I think that's important as we talk about self-care is, like you, I'm involved in many different things. And I think as we think about self-care and boundaries, it's really helpful to think about our different roles and what the different um, expectations are in those roles. So I'm both a, a leader and kind of an executive as a Senior Director for the health system, I also am a teacher in terms of what I'm doing with education. I do provide some direct spiritual care services, particularly with employees. And my most recent thing, which has been so exciting, has been developing myself as a coach, which has just been a lovely addition to the skill set of being a chaplain. And um, so I wanted you just to be aware of all that as we're talking about setting boundaries and, and um, how different roles maybe require different kinds of boundaries and different ways of thinking about that. So. Thanks. Thank you, Paul. I appreciate the variety of perspectives that you're bringing here. Um, many have read the Cerulean Bowl, but could you remind us how that became a symbol of self-care for you? Oh, thank you. Yeah, this has been a um, this was a has been a career long image for me, and um, so I tell people that I'm, I've been doing this for forty years or more. But I started when I was twelve, and that's sort of a joke. But anyway. Um, the, um, but early, very early on, I was working in hospice and um, it was sort of an in-between position because I was really hoping to be able to become an educator. And um, But anyway, I was working in hospice and I was working in Birmingham, Alabama. It was a very challenged area of the city that I was um, assigned to, to see patients. And um, it, it really, um, it was a, it was a, it was a um, setup for burnout in a lot of ways. Um, I was lonely. I went into work on a Monday, met with the team, but then I had my list of people to see for the week. And I rarely interacted with any of my colleagues at any other point during the week. So I was driving in my car and I was seeing one patient after another. And there wasn't much opportunity for me to debrief or to get support from, for myself in terms of my work. I was also very young and inexperienced. And I think, um, you know, as I've gotten older, I've learned strategies but at that point in my career, I really didn't have a plan um, necessarily about how to take care of myself. And then the other thing was just not having thought through um, what it would be like to have to be able to set boundaries and to say no. And as you all know, the social when when there are social uh, contexts that's challenging for patients and and they're sick and they're dying, that that combination of things can mean that the needs are just overwhelming. And so how do I, how did I, as a professional person, think about what is my part of that, but not the whole, the whole thing. And I think I really took on thinking that I was responsible for way more than I was actually responsible for. And the Cerulean Bowl really came out of a, an interaction I had with a mentor. And thank goodness I had the wisdom to go to somebody and say, I'm not going to be able to sustain this. Um, in fact, I'm not sure I should be a chaplain based on my what I'm doing right now because it's not working. And um, I don't I cannot remember to this day if he actually suggested that to me or I came up with it myself. But the idea was that there was a bowl and it was an imaginary bowl, but I would hold it. And in my mind's eye, this bowl is beautiful. It's blue. It has um, it's it's clear. It's it's just a beautiful piece of art, really. And I hold it between myself and the person I'm with. 
and they can put into it whatever they wanted. Um, they could put their pain, their hurt, their fears, their joys, whatever it was, anger, and I would hold it between us. I could receive it. And then when the visit was over, I would simply turn over the contents of that bowl back to the universe. And in my own theology, my own spirituality, that for me, that was a loving presence that could um, essentially take over again, caring for this person that I had been with. And I started to do that practice and I started to feel relief from the just the incredible stress that I had put on myself around being with these patients and that I was, I was seeing them more often than I needed to see them. I had developed a food pantry for them. Um, Chris and I were talking about the fact that we're, that we're both Quakers and in my Quaker meeting in Birmingham at the time, I got them all involved. And so we were, we were providing all kinds of extra services for them that were not part of my role. And I wasn't sharing any of that with the hospice team. So I created a part of parallel service uh, that I was providing that I wasn't integrating into my work. So um, it was a lot of trouble and I had found this image that really did work for me. Paula, as you mentioned, that was quite a while ago. So I'm wondering, are there things you've added since then to help with your self-care and boundary setting? Yeah, so, um, so what has been sort of remarkable to me as I think back about that is that that image of the cerulean bowl has really sustained me over all these years. I still use the image of that bowl. And um, I think it's probably more intuitive and maybe not so conscious sometimes, but particularly when I'm having a difficult interaction with someone, that's the image that I use. And just this morning, I had a, a Zoom meeting with, uh, it was a difficult uh, patient situation. And I, as I was getting onto the Zoom, I thought I, I, I just, for a moment, held that bowl consciously there for myself because I needed to just remember to bring it back, remember that I'm in this conversation and I don't have to take it on myself. This is going to be something that we can hold together. Um, the other thing about the bowl image, which has become really helpful, is that it didn't occur to me at the time, but over the years that I'm also looking at myself in that bowl. And so it's given me an opportunity to sort of distance, to, to differentiate what I'm doing from who I am as well, so that I could reflect on my practice. I could look at what went well and what didn't go well. So what's in the bowl is what the person's giving me, but also what I'm doing and how I'm, how I'm interacting. And so it's given me a kind of a context for how to evaluate my work and how to be more self-reflective and how I, what's helpful and not helpful with people. Um, the other thing is that I've, I've, I probably have also shortened my ritual of turning things over. And I have a, a little bit of a commute going back and forth to work. And so when, I, but I do get in the car every day and I do go through kind of what I need to give back to the universe in, in essence. And I have had days when I've, the image that I've had is that I'm throwing things out the window of the car. Like instead of just handing it over, it's like, get, you know, like um, the, this is something I really need to let go of. Um, so it's become a more inner, it's become a little more almost humorous to me as a, and at the end of the day that there are definitely things that are not mine to take on and, you know, uh, I can really let them go. Um, it's really, but I'm, I think, um, I'm just, I'm kind of amazed to think about that practice that's really been a sustaining thing for me over my career. So, yeah. The other thing I think I probably should just say about this all is that I don't know what all your all story is. My own personal story is of uh, really not wanting to disappoint people. And, um, and I really, and that's, I think, part of the reason why I take things on so much. And so I think over the years, I've also clarified that much more for myself around, you know, what is that part of me that is so committed to uh, over, kind of overdoing it or overworking or taking on more than I need to. And uh, so it's been, a, I think, a really good transformative thing for me also to start to understand that while I'm holding this bowl, I also need to be working on my own, um, my own story, my own narrative that feeds that need for me to, um, to just take on things that really are not mine to take on. So, thanks for that, Paula. As you talked, I thought about how that's a special temptation for those of us who are not in revenue generating wings of the hospital to take on more than we should to prove 
that were worth being here. So it was a good reminder. How do you think about boundaries now? Yeah, so um, so I, I've, I've, it's been really helpful um, as I was preparing for this today to sort of get into, I didn't, th I hadn't really conceptualized what I, the way I think about it. So let me just tell you what came to me as I was thinking about this talk. And that is that I have sort of layers of boundaries, the way that I think about it now. Um, and the first layer is what I think of as kind of an established boundary or a dictated boundary where in my role, this is what I'm supposed to be doing is familiar. It's a, it's a, it's expected kind of a boundary. And when I think about that hospice situation all those years ago, there was that established boundary that, that I had, that I could have relied on. That was how many patients I had, how much time I was supposed to spend, how many of them I was supposed to see in a week. So there were those kinds of established boundaries that I could have gone back to, to give me some structure. Um, then I also think about boundaries for that then become more negotiated in terms of professional practice. So there are boundaries that are more perme permeable. And the way that I think about that is that sometimes there may be the need to not do that dictated practice because there's a good rationale for it. Um, the thing is that I have to be clear about what that rationale is and how I can justify that and have I really reflected on it. So back to the hospice example, if I was going to see a patient three times a week, why am I doing that? What is the rationale for that? And then in addition to that, the next layer of the boundaries is negotiating then if I do this, what's the consequence going to be for, in other words, what other patient am I not going to see then? Or how much time am I going to have to take away from another visit or another person? And is it okay to negotiate like that? Um, and I often say to our students at the hospital that if you if you spend an hour with this person, what other three people are you not seeing? And can you actually say to yourself, that's going to be okay for me not to have gone to those other people? And that's the kind of question around that. And then the third thing that's occurred to me, and this has been, I think, um, or maybe this is the fourth thing over all these years is that I do actually have another boundary, which is hard, which is a no. Uh, and a no is a no. And um, one of the big revelations to me has been that no is a complete sentence. It's just no. And that I have to do that around uh, things that are other commitments like my family or my own self-care. Um, I, I go swim three times a week. And um, there was a long time in my practice where I thought, I couldn't actually do that because I would have to leave work a little early. And what would people think about that? And, and it's been really interesting to me that I've established that practice. And now the people that work with me know that I leave on Monday and Wednesday at three 30 to go swim and they wish me well, <laughs> you know, have a good swim and they don't resent that I'm not there for an hour and a half or two hours. And I'm not working less actually. And the modeling of taking care of myself, I think, has huge implications. And so, so that developing that capacity to say, no, this is my swim time. I'm not going to do this now. Um, I mean, and I guess if there was a disaster or something, of course, I would pull back. But on most days, there's no question that things can wait and I'm going to go swim. So um, so the whole thing of boundaries, I think, has to, has to have more of nuance and it has to be more sophisticated. Thanks, Paula. And this is my last prepared question for you, which is what recommendations do you have for setting boundaries and for self-care for those on this call who are providing direct care in a professional setting? Yeah, so, so I have three things that I wanted to mention here. The first thing is that I think everyone is different and we all have to do our own work around this in order to decide what's the best for us. And so the cerulean bowl is um, was my image, and I I often meet with um, medical students at Hopkins. I do a I'm part of a longitudinal course for them when they're in their residency program, and one of the things I say to them is that is that they've got to figure this out for themselves. They've got to step back and figure out what's going to be their cerulean bowl, what's going to be their strategy for how not to take things on, because the goal here is that you want to be able to be present, you want to be able to be caring, you want to be able to 
engage, but you don't want to take things on to yourself so that you're not able to con- to sustain your practice. And I know all of you are acutely aware of burnout, the high numbers of burnout for care providers, uh, physicians, nurses, chaplains. And so for all of us, I think we have to honor how we're different and how we figure it out for ourselves. And then the second thing is, I think going back to that, um, and Krista mentioned this in a, in, with the whole idea of how things are funded, what are the clear expectations? And I think that for me, one of the things that's been really helpful has been to decide to get that really clear about exactly what is expected. So then I'm not trying to either overdo it or guess or whatever. And the idea that we're that these boundaries and expectations aren't clear is um, it, it makes it creates more stress and it creates more or, or maybe it creates it creates the tendency to try to maybe do more than we have to do. Um, and it's always been kind of eye-opening to me that people probably expect less of me than I expect of myself. And so there's figuring that out has been really helpful over the years. And then the third thing is um, that to figure out what sustains you underneath all of this. And um, you know, the practice of the cerulean bowl, the the part of it that's been, you know, nurturing for me has been this idea that I'm turning something back over to a universe of love that I believe in. And and you all will have different beliefs about all that, but but what will be that thing that supports you and sustains you in this? And the image that I often have is of a, a kind of a pie and that I'm only responsible for this very small slice of this, you know, three hours I've been with this person over a you know a few days or weeks. And so in their whole life, that's a really small part of who they are. And that image of that with the idea that there is a loving presence out there in the world has really sustained me. It's been able, it's been a kind of a a root, a vision, a, 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 a value that sustains me. And I think that there are, there are lots of ways to figure that out, but what, what sustains you in that way? What, how, how do you find something that, um, that makes it so that you can have your part, but you're not the whole part of everything. So, um, so I think that's it. Yeah. Well, thank you so much, Paula. I can see that we have some questions. Um, I'm going to read one that comes from Steve. He asks, is this a commonly taught practice model? He said, during fellowship training in 2006, I was taught to use this way to approach my interactions with patients. Oh, that's really cool. I didn't know that. I, you know, this, this whole idea of Cerulean Bowl is something that, you know, I've used for all these years and I don't know about how it's become sort of a common practice. So that's really, that's really cool to know. Um, but I do, I do think it's probably, um, it's probably out there somewhere in the literature that it's really important to somehow differentiate who we are as ourselves from what we do. And that that differentiation is really important. And this bowl is, is a kind of a manifestation of that idea that when we're doing our work, we're doing something that's not actually who we are but it's what we're doing and that there's, there's, that's really two different concepts. Um, And so I would think that, that that would fit into that idea. Yeah. That's really cool. Thank you. And Jake, would you mind unmuting yourself? Sure. Uh, I I have to say uh, as a, uh, I'm I'm an educator candidate right now with ACPE. So I'm going to use your article with my students. So thank you. Oh, that's great. That's great. Uh, my question for for you with within this this community of practice that we are here, I love the the image of the bowl, and I I, I want to kind of uh, nuance it a little bit with the idea of when things stick to the bowl, and and we're trying to throw it out the car window, and it keeps sticking. I wonder what are some exercises you use to unstick those items. Uh, with yourself or with your students? That is a really great question. You know, and that's a, that's a really good point that over the years, a really big, it's like a, it's a, it's a flag, a red flag. When I get to the end of the day and I'm ready to turn things over and I can't, it sticks with me. And that's a great image. And it, I go home with it. I'm wake up the next morning and I'm still thinking about it. 
Um, if it's one of those things, and that for me is the clue that I need to debrief with someone, I need to do a little more work with myself because something about this is also about me. Um, and so that there's there's some way that this person or this interaction is is impacting who I am. And, and the way that I think about it is that it's really the opportunity for more healing for ourselves. You know, maybe there's some place in me that's still um, hurting over something or that there's some grief that hasn't been fully addressed somehow. Um, a, a good example of that was back in 1998 when my dad died, and, excuse me, my dad died in 1998. And you would think, you know, that's been a long time ago, but there's still these moments where I'll be interacting with an older gentleman who will remind me of my dad. And I'm, this happened to me about three months ago with a staff person at Bayview. And I realized I was worried, kind of worrying about the interaction that I had had with him. And what dawned on me was that he was so much like my dad. And so there was this little bit of, you know, I wish I could have done this with my dad. Uh, that was still there. And once I kind of got that clear, it was much easier to just set aside that interaction that I had had and to really trust that it had gone as well as it could and I had done my best. Um, but I think that's a great question. I love that. I'm going to use that, that it sticks to the bowl. It won't quite come out. Yeah, I love that. Thank you. Marty, would you mind sharing? Yeah, I, I appreciate Jake's question. It kind of got at a lot of the same themes that I did. Because when I read this, when I read this paper, I, I was drawn to some some of the statements you made about how when you struggle to release things, maybe let's call it sticking to the bowl now, yeah. that it feels like there's a hook or a connection to your own story. And I I think chaplains have a leg up on us clinicians because mm -hmm. I think they are trained to recognize what are they bringing to these encounters. And I don't think we we get that quite as much, at least mm -hmm. us uh, NPs, PAs, nurses, and docs. And I was going to kind of ask you as to just why why there are certain cases that we struggle so much with and we bring home and they just keep us up at night. And I think you kind of got at a lot of that. And that's when that happens, we need to realize what is it about us? Mm -hmm. You know, there's a there's also a layer of um, for me, the other piece of this is when I'm really powerless about something. And, it, mm. um, you know, I think the other things that stick with me are that it or when there's clear injustice or there's some inequity or there's something that feels so wrong to me about that interaction. And it, maybe it's not something I'm doing, but it's more of the context that it's in and and realizing that i what what can i actually do and what do i actually have no power over around the situation um and that those are also the ones that stick i think and having to figure out you know what could i actually do or say that might impact the situation and what honestly i'm not going to have anything to say, be able to say about this um there was a there was a person in our hospital who a young person who was 15 or 16 an undocumented person and he was just stuck in our hospital and the 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 dynamics whatever the politics or whatever anybody thinks this poor man this young man was just simply stuck there and those were one of those things that um bothered me a lot there there was some of the I couldn't just you know throw it out the car window so to speak but I, I carried it and tried my best to figure out you know what if anything did I could I say or do about that um so I think sometimes it's personal and sometimes it's systemic around, you know, what we carry to. Yeah. Thanks, Paula. I have a question of, of my own that I've been thinking about. Um, if the cerulean bowl kind of represents this place of both connection and differentiation between myself and a patient, I wonder about any encouragement or advice you'd give for people who are experiencing, say, moral distress or um, secondary traumatic stress, and it feels a lot like that cerulean, cerulean bowl has just slipped through their fingers and crashed on the floor. Mm. What would you say to them? Well, I think trauma... Um... I wish, you know, this is one of, if I could wave a magic wand, I wish that we would do more with understanding trauma in all of our educational systems, 
um, because you know the statistics show that um, a great majority of people either have experienced some trauma in their in their growing up, they experienced systemic trauma of some kind, they experienced generational trauma of some kind, or they're second victims or or second survivors of trauma through work or other witness trauma. And so that means that there is a large group of us who have that uh, triggering experiences of trauma. And so when we're in the midst of holding someone else's story, and when we're triggered by that story, then that's going to mean that we're not really able to hold it very well. Um, and your image of the bowl slipping through your fingers is uh, just so apt, I think, because when you're, you know, and, and with trauma, we're reacting. We're not, we're not in our frontal part of our brains. We're back in the, we're back in our uh, reactive, protective um, neurological systems that are not really thinking about what we're doing. And so I think being able as, as professionals and clinicians and practitioners to be able to stop ourselves and say, oh my goodness, I'm being, I'm triggered right now. My, my trauma, my trauma history or my story is making it really hard for me to even hold this bowl. And I need someone else to hold a bowl for me, actually. Um, and so I think it's like back to the image of sticking. It's more than sticking. It's, it's like the bowl just, I can't even hold it right now. And I think that that, and again, back to the, the the interpretation I make is that that's an opportunity for healing. And so often, you know, the work, the working through trauma is not a one and done kind of thing. It's a process and it takes time and it takes ongoing practice. And um, I just, I, I appreciate your question so much because I don't think we pay enough attention to that. And out of this, you know, out of this pandemic, I think, I think a lot of us have been traumatized um, healthcare professionals and how we come out of this now and work with our own trauma. Um, and people tell the stories people are telling me about these memories of you know, the night that they were there with patients who had no one and they were dying. And the, the people that, I mean, just the different things that people had to go through with their own families even. Um, so I, I think there's an opportunity here for us to be caring toward each other and toward ourselves. I feel like I just did a sermon. I'm sorry, but it, it really hey. tapped, tapped into a passion of mine. So thank you for the question. Yeah. Well, it certainly encouraged me and I imagine it encouraged the rest of our team here. Thank you so much for being with us today, Paula. It was okay. a privilege to, to learn from you. Oh, this is a great pleasure. You know, I love talking about this stuff. So thank you for the opportunity. <laughs> yeah, and God, you know, bless you all in a, a wonderful, um, you know, as you go through your practice. Yep. Thank you. Thank you.